to kick off our last panel, I'm basically just going to hand it over to Ken because we've already introduced these folks over and over and over again. I think the one person who we haven't is Bobby Calvan, uh, head of AJ Media Watch, uh, and he flew over from Washington, D.C. So I'm going to hand it over to Ken Mortsugu, AJ National Vice President for Print, uh, to carry it on. I can use this. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. This work. Hello. Hi, uh, so I'm the uh, vice president of AJ. I'm also the former Asia chapter president. I'm based in Bangkok. And uh, we've had a really wonderful, wonderful conference. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And hope you've had a, had a good time and learned a lot and so forth. I, I just wanted to um, wrap up this conference with this panel to take advantage of the fact that we have so many uh, national leaders of AJ from the US who have come out to join us for this conference, uh, join us at this conference for the first time this year. And uh, we're privileged to have um, not only the current president of AJ, but uh, his two predecessors as president. Uh, we have Paul, as you know, is the, is the my Bush and Clinton. <laughs> exactly. Oh! <laughs> which is you mean which. JFK? Which is which. <laughs> um, and before Paul, Doris was the, the president for the previous two years, and then before that, Sharon was the president. So it's really wonderful to have the, that kind of support from uh, the national organization. I think it also shows that we're, how far we've come uh, in, in developing our group out here in Asia. And um, the other person, as Ramey mentioned, that's joining us from uh, Washington, D.C., is uh, Bobby Calvan, who's the uh, national board rep for the Washington chapter and also head of a program called AJ Media Watch. So I, I wanted to take the opportunity today, uh, just briefly, because I know you're all waiting for the raffle, to talk, uh, to talk a little bit about um, AJ and, uh, and what, what it stands for and the issue of diversity, which is one of our core issues. Um, I, I think that the, the Asia chapter, of course, was founded by um, members like Alan Cheng in, in the back there who, uh, who were members in the US who moved out to Asia. And uh, as increasing numbers of Asian American journalists moved out to Asia, saw the need for uh, forming a chapter here. Um, but then our, our growth has really exploded in the last uh, two or three years. Um, and a lot of that growth has been kind of organic within Asia. It's not people who came from the US, but just people who are already out here in Asia working and uh, wanted to join us. And, and that's been terrific. And uh, we've had a, a really great run. And I think it's, it's going to continue. Um, at the same time, I, I think that this is a, an opportunity to, because we have these national leaders here, to talk a little bit about um, what is AJ? What does it stand for in the U.S.? And what are the issues, um, the diversity issues that, that we all care about so much? So um, just what I wanted to do was just uh, go through um, talking a little bit about or uh, having our panelists talk a little bit about what is diversity and why it is important in the media industry. Um, and then um, talk a little bit about the state of diversity, where, where we are in, in sort of the the movement to um, improve and increase uh, diversity within uh, media newsrooms in the US. Um, and then if, if we have time permitting, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, Asia and maybe hear a little bit from you guys about, you know, is diversity an issue in Asia? Should it be? Um, and have kind of a, a discussion among AJ and Asia about, you know, is this something that we want to think about and talk about a little more going forward as we mature as a, as a chapter and organization? So. Um, let, let me, let's start first with the issue of sort of what is diversity and, and why is it important? And um, I don't know who wants to, uh, who wants to define diversity for us? And, and it's kind of obvious, but do you want to take a shot, Mr. President? <laughs> I mean, I think that's the obvious, you know, definition of diversity. So, and then there's also the not so obvious definition of diversity. I think when, in, at least in the US, when people think about diversity, they really think about minority advancement or um, LBGT and women, you know. But when I think about diversity, it go beyond ethnicity and gender. It really goes to, you know, the core of coverage. You know, do we have diversity economically? You know, do we have diversity in disciplines? Um, I think I'm the second national president that represent visual in AAJA. Um, I think Victor was the only other one. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have diversity, you know, among geography? So it's great that we have a large Asia pre presence before, because, like Ken said, I think you guys bring the, the A into A Asian. The Asian into A. <laughs> yeah. Asia. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, you know, I think you know, and and also diversity include um, the majority, because to be truly diversity, I think 
I prefer to use the, the term inclusive, being inclusive mm -hmm. rather than diversity. Okay, thank you, Paul. So I, I, I wanted to um, ask the panelists to talk a little bit about why we think diversity or inclusiveness is important in the news media. Why, why do we need it? And I think I'm going to start with Bobby, if, uh, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about our activities in Media Watch and, and what, what we do with that, explain what that is to the, to the audience. Sure. Well, first of all, let me um, um, tell you that one of the uh, um, questions I get asked a lot in the States is, where am I from? You know, um, and it sounds like a simple question uh, that would ordinarily deserve a simple answer, but it's rather complicated. Um, as Asian Americans, um, we are this, you know, perpetual, sometimes perpetual, um, seemingly perpetual, uh, you know, uh, foreigner um, because of what we look like, what we eat, perhaps even our names, you know. So we have this, this sense of being different in many ways through the eyes of, of uh, many people we live with, work with, um, people we are, um, uh, we come across in, in the U.S. And a lot of that um, oftentimes spills into uh, what we see on the TV news, what we read in newspapers and magazines. And Media Watch um, is one of the, uh, um, uh, what I think is one of the most important programs in uh, uh, you know, uh, AJA because our job is to monitor um, what is written about our communities. And oftentimes, what is written about our communities um, can be rather uh, harmful because they're not accurate, uh, they're not fair, um, and news companies need to know that, hey, we're watching, uh, we would like to be uh, written about in a fair way um, that doesn't damage our communities and, and how other people uh, perceive us. I mean, you know, uh, there's a Former New York Times Pulitzer Prize winner, Joel Brinkley, who now teaches um, at Stanford University uh, Journalism. And he was in Vietnam recently, and he wrote a, uh, a, a, a column about his experience in Vietnam. You know? And it was fine for him to write about what he saw. Um, but when it came across the ocean, a lot of people got upset about the fact that he had pictures of, of skinned rats, of how um, the fact that Vietnamese eat meat, and that explains why they are aggressive. Um, again, his observations, but it was also very harmful to a lot of us, a lot of the uh, Vietnamese communities. You know, I mean, does that mean, does that explain why there are Vietnamese gangs? Does that mean that, uh, you know, Vietnamese people are naturally aggressive and you know, we should be afraid of them. Um, you know, so a lot of things that are written about us, um, well, shouldn't be written about us, for one thing. And we need the help of everybody here, whether or not in the U.S. or here in Asia, to make sure that uh, what's written about us is, um, um, you know, accurate and, 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 and fair. So that's what our job is. Let, let me just interject. Does that mean that uh, the media should not be critical of Asian Americans? There's a difference between being critical of, well, critical of Asian Americans or... Or write critical stories about Asian Americans. No, I don't think they should be writing critical um, stories about Asian Americans. They should be writing critical stories about what Asian Americans do wrong, um, but not about us, you know. Again, it's like this whole debate about, um, you know, wh who, wh whether or not we should use the word uh, or the phrase uh, illegal immigrant, you know. We shouldn't brand people. Um, we can describe and perhaps criticize the actions that they, uh, you know, they take, and look at that. That's merits, but just because you know we're Asian Americans, I mean, I don't think that we deserve any um, scrutiny because of it. You know? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me uh, move on to Doris uh, because uh, she was telling me earlier that the Washington Post has a new diversity policy, and there was considerable debate and discussion went into what exactly that policy should be. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that is and how that plays out in American newsrooms. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, there's a diversity committee at the Post, and I'm one of the co-chairs. And our committee is getting started on really trying to be strategic about our hiring and ensuring that the people who are already in the newsroom feel like they are getting opportunities for professional development and growth. 
because we want people who are post-quality candidates to stay and be a part of the company and grow with the company and um, do good work. So I'm just going to read you the mission statement because it's, it's short um, and it's, it's for the committee itself. Um, it says that the diversity committee's biggest role will be in shaping how people from diverse backgrounds are hired and developed in the Washington Post newsroom. We strive to be open about our process and we welcome input. We define diversity as a means to help the Post achieve its journalistic goals because there's value for everyone, especially consumers of Post journalism in a newsroom staff equipped to cover a variety of communities and issues. And part of the lengthy discussion was what is diversity? And you can, it's, it's like an onion. I mean, there's just layer after layer after layer. Just like Paul was saying, there's the economic, there's the geography, there's religion. Um, very, uh, I feel like a, a very few pr people who are journalists, at, at least in the US, have experience working in the military or even have family members who are military members. So that's a significant portion of the American population. And for us to be reporting on it, but to, to not actually have the familiarity um, can pose a challenge when you're trying to report on something that you just don't really understand, like the culture, because uh, obviously the military has its own very specific culture, Th those kinds of things. That's what we want to think about, and we really want to help bring that kind of diversity into our newsroom because that reflects the community that we're reporting on. Can, can I add something on why diversity is important? The reason diversity is important, and you may not see this in Asia, but the journalism industry is shrinking. <laughs> in the US. Um, papers, you know, their print advertising revenue is going down, there are layoffs, um, and you know, at the Seattle Times, our newsroom is half the size it used to be. And the reason, I think that one of the reasons the industry is shrinking is because it is not relevant to the current population of the United States. Diversity is a business imperative. So if 26% of America is made up of racial minorities, only 13% of them are represented in newsrooms. And uh, you know we're not even at that point looking at the stories and what the stories are about. So um, I agree that diversity, with what Paul said, that diversity is about many different things. But if the US journalism industry wants to survive, it first needs to represent who Americans are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, Sharon. Do you also want to talk, Sharon is also on the editorial board of the Seattle Times. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about diversity on the editorial board and what that means. Sure. I mean, I think the Seattle Times, under the leadership of our former managing editor, Alex McLeod, really became a leader. In the 80s, they set a goal. We want to be at parity with, the, with Seattle. And so the Seattle Times, I think, is about 26% people of color. But um, as we've shrunk, I just, you know, I recently looked around and I was like, oh, there are no Asian Americans on our Metro desk. There are no Asian American Metro reporters, there are no Asian American Metro editors. And the reason I noticed this was when the Kenneth Bay story happened, you know, on the editorial board, we were all over it. And I think part of that was because of my relationship with AJA and having been president when Roxana, Saberi, Laura Ling, and Yuna Lee were all detained. Um, so I was like, we need to jump in and we need to say something. And as a result, I th the editorial board has really been driving the coverage forward on Kenneth Bay's detention. And to the point where I'm kind of wondering, like, where is the newsroom? And I look at the newsroom, and I think one of the reasons is because there are not Asian Americans in, in the newsroom. On the editorial board, we have two Asian American women. And I also think the other issue is that, you know what, two, reporters do stories that are easy. <laughs> A lot of reporters, especially when you have constrained resources, you need to be, like, filling the news hole each day. Um, it's hard to report on the Korean American community. And if you don't understand that, you know, there's a, a level of distrust with the media, discomfort with talking to the media, being on the record, then if you're a reporter, you might just turn around and make the phone calls, and if they don't call you back, go work on a different story. Sure. I'm, I'm watching the, the clock here carefully so we, we don't run over too much. But I want, before I move on to the state of diversity, I kind of wanted to hear from the audience and to see um, I don't know how much of this is new to you or what you've heard, uh, if you've heard this all before sort of thing, but um, let's just take five minutes maybe for, um, are there any questions or observations from the, the audience? Raise your hand. Two in front here. Hi, my name is, my name is Yu Gang. Um, AP technology writer. 
Uh, I'm not very familiar with diversity in the U.S. media. I grew up in South Korea. So I'll, I have a question about whether your efforts to uh, promote diversity stretches to making sure uh, what kind of coverage Asian American journalists uh, cover. Like, do, do they show really, does it really, how does it make a difference? Do they really make a difference if there are more Asian American journalists represented in the newsroom? And is that also part of the, what diversity com committee follows? Like what kind of coverage they cover? Well, let me speak to that as a reporter. As an Asian American, um, I can go to my editors and say, hey, this is what I saw in my neighborhoods because where I lived and the communities that I live in happen to be populated with a lot of Asian Americans, you know? So as a person who lives in that community, I can go to my editor and say, you know, this um, um, festival or, or, or whatever event or, or some, you know, concern, uh, is bubbling up uh, within the Filipino community, for example. You know, so I can actually advocate within my newsroom that we cover certain stories um, that might be of interest to, I think, everybody in the community, but in particular to the communities that I'm a part of. And again, going back to what Sharon said, you know, newspapers are missing a big part of the market because they're not, um, you know, addressing the issues that uh, are important to a lot of uh, ethnic communities. So as a reporter, I made sure that I voiced what I needed to voice within my, uh, you know, uh, editors, uh, uh, my editors, and and got stories in the paper. Even if I didn't do it, you know, I would go and suggest, hey, maybe somebody on Metro. Uh, should should cover this, or even within my own beat. I used to cover healthcare in Sacramento. You know, I would find people and purposely find people so that my stories are populated with different types of names, um, whether or not they're Asian sounding. Um, you know, you can't really tell whether or not a person is 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 you know black or or or, or white. Sometimes I um, can't even tell my name sometimes whether or not I'm Asian. But um, I try and populate them with different types of names, whether or not it's Latina or obvious, you know, um, a Japanese name. I go out searching for, for them and because I think that's my responsibility to do that and let other people within the community at large um, realize that, you know, our community is a diverse community. Well, I mean, besides getting people who are reporting, it's really important to get people who are diverse in the leadership ranks and that's where we really struggle. Um, four of the publishers of newspapers in the United States happen to be Asian American, and two of them are graduates of our executive leadership program. But there are very few people who are senior managers in the broadcast industry. There, um, I'm not sure if there are any owners of online-only um, newsrooms that are Asian American. There, there might be, because there are so many ways to slice that niche. But um, the, like, the Huffington Post ownership is, is not um, diverse. So you have to think that you know if somebody's controlling the pocketbook, they can also drive what kind of things are important priorities to cover. And AAJA has also helped in trying to get things that aren't uh, necessarily going to be reported on by working on uh, media access. We work with undercovered, um, underrepresented communities in the United States to help people like the Hmong community or um, other other groups that aren't necessarily well represented to learn how to work with the media, that if you give us a news release on the day of your event, it's probably not going to get covered. Um, if you have some sort of major crisis, you need to have a designated person to speak on your behalf, and maybe that person isn't your organization's president. You want the person who can best articulate your perspective to a larger audience. And um, some of our chapter leaders are very active about sending out information to their chapter um, members about possible areas of coverage, like you know some sort of news release that maybe only hit that chapter president. Um, they'll send it out to the wider membership, and I've seen some of our members go and make reports and do stories about something that came through that route. So that's kind of how we try to help get those stories out there. Uh, I think Hannah had a question, our vice president from Seoul. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, as you guys know, I'm Hannah from Seoul. Um, I, I feel like as an American working in South Korea, um, part of diversity is also, um, it, in Seoul at least, I mean, 
Korea is typically a home, has traditionally been a, ho a very homogeneous society, and um, and it's opening up a lot. And I think that organizations like AAJA that emphasize di diversity can um, can be an example to uh, to populations that are becoming more diverse um, and creating better understanding. I know that in Seoul, in particular, we have a really diverse group of of members, like many who. Are not American. Some I, I'm, I'm not a full-time journalist. Um, I mean, it's it's a really big mix of people, and um, and I think that it helps people become more open-minded and uh, understanding. It's not like oh, isn't Asia weird? It's like oh, this is Asia. We get it. This is our home. So that's something that I think that um, AHA Asia really offers. I think Eric had a question. Sure. Yeah. There's, uh, why don't we go to Sean first, and then to Eric in the back? Sean, sorry, uh, up there on the. Or AJ Asia Chapter Treasurer. Sean. Oh. Well, I've been, uh, I'm Sean, uh, AJ Seoul. I've been in Seoul for about five years, but I do remember, you know, working in Asian American media um, and all the struggle, all the angst, but then I take one plane ride, I go to Korea, I'm suddenly part of the majority. And it completely is a different perspective, and then it really does. Um, seeing it from the other side and then seeing, like, not to use Jack as an example, but he goes on a plane ride to Korea too, works there, he becomes part of the minority. And so you could kind of see that, you know, these issues are, you know, very relevant, but I guess my question is, what can we do as the Asia chapter with a different perspective? Like, I guess we have the more of the majority perspective or maybe some of the resources. What can we do to help the, the broader chapters over in these states? I mean, I think, you know, as businesses become more international, you know, it's really important for Asia chapter to really voice in on coverage. So when Japan tsunami happened, or when the Shoshuan earthquake happened, or when, you know, all these coverage about China and, you know, their food supply happened, you know, it's really important for Asia chapter to say, you know what, how do you actually cover Asia? Like, how do you cover a country as, as interesting as China where, you know, you know, a lot of times in the U.S. we use Twitter, we use Facebook as some sources, but we don't have that in China. So how do we go about covering China for the U.S. media? So I think, you know, as stories become more internet globalized, I think we need to become more globalized. We need to be more sensitive, not only to what's going on within the U.S., but also what's going on, you know, in, in other parts of the world. I mean, now there's a lot of Asia influence in Latin America because of you know, um, China's growing demand of natural resources. So, you know, when we think about how AJ could expand, you know, part of our mission is to really just educate newsroom throughout, you know, the world. How do we actually properly cover a country? I mean, there's not that many foreign correspondents like running around. I mean, that pool is shrinking. So the local expertise become increasingly more important, and it needs to be more integrated. There's no longer us versus them. There's no you know foreign correspondent like you are a journalist. That's it. I mean, every one of us is foreign correspondent in some way. You know, I, you know, I do interactive, and that could be really foreign for some people. I mean, I would say a basic thing would be for members of the Asia chapter to be on Media Watch mm -hmm. <laughs> and be able to offer expertise on stories about Asia. Well, this is kind of like, you know, Vietnamese people eating rats. That's not a very sophisticated story. That's, you know, that's poor journalism. Well, another example, and, and um, I forget the details, and maybe you can remember, um, um, uh, Doris, the uh, um, story out of uh, Japan, Tokyo, and the uh, that word in the lead. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, somebody who's uh, based in Tokyo had written a column and he had used in the lead the, uh, the typically docile Japanese. And that just jumped out at me because it's a phrase that um, it's um, like st stereotypes that are positive, like, oh, all Asians are great at math, are equally harmful. So. That's something that just kind of jumped out at me, and I posted it to Media Watch, not to say, oh, we need to go and, um, you know, strike in front of this person's building, but just what what do other folks think? And the interesting perspective was from some of our members who have lived and worked in Tokyo, and they all said, uh, we sort of see what your point is, but also that's just how they would describe it. That being and living in Japan, that's something that is not necessarily uncommon, and that they would describe themselves that way in terms of protests. That was that was the um, context of it, that the 
Japanese typically do not uh, protest. And I just said, well, I thought that there could have been a potentially different word other than docile. And so I did send a note directly to the writer, and he wrote back, you know, I, I didn't really think about that. Thank you so much. I will look into AAJA. I'm not sure if he ended up joining um, the Tokyo subchapter, but that's something that we should probably follow up on because I think that it's good to have that person's perspective as well. And also the, the nuances is so different from country to country. So even if you're using a word to describe something in English, but when you translate that into Chinese, to Vietnamese, to Cambodia, it could have a complete different connotations. And I, mean, I can't help to you know, bring out this example, that, which is not Asian related, it's actually um, Spanish. Um, at the Miami Herald where um, we did a story about this TV reporter using this word um, that really is about this fish group, grouper. But in Colombian, they, in term, you know, they, they interpret that as um, a derogatory term for homosexuals. But in Venezuelan, that word is nothing harmful about it. So I think, again, as stories travel throughout the regions, you know, there's a lot more nuances that we need to be more attuned to. How, how does you know, one word or one phrase or one image that you're projecting play out, not only in the US, but in Asia or in Latin America or in Europe? Um, Eric, I'll come back to you in a second. I just wanted to bring uh, Jeremiah Fu into the conversation. Um, raise your hand so the mic can come to you. Um, Jeremiah, as many of you know, is a professor here and at Shantou University in China. Um, he's also worked in Malaysia extensively as a, as a journalist. And Malaysia is quite an interesting country, as many of you know, because it is very ethnically and racially diverse, um, somewhat parallel to the US. And I just wanted to get his perspective on, on both Malaysia and China and diversity and, and what does it mean in, in Asia? Okay, in, in Malaysia, um, we, we have three main races, Chinese, Malay, and Indian. Uh, I, I work, I, I write for a, a technology paper called Intech under the star. So within the paper itself, we have 12 people on the desk and none of us studied, only one of us studied journalism. We have one doctor, we have, I'm an architect. We have a bio, we have a petrochemical engineer. We have a psychologist. We, uh, so yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a very diverse oh, mix of awesome. people from different <laughs> backgrounds. And, and different et, uh, ethnic backgrounds. So uh, the, 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 the psychologist is, a, is an Indian, then the doctor is a Chinese, and there's an American Chinese who is a petrochemical engineer. So, so when you have all these people come together, we argue on stories and, and we, we have this whiteboard on the paper, on, 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 the, on the wall that says longest word of the day. So we actually look down at people who use big words. So <laughs> the moment you use a very big word, and then we'll put that word on the wall, and then that's it. We'll laugh at you for the whole day. <laughs> so, 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 but, but it's, a, it's a good practice because it, it gives us um, a more, what's that word? Sensitivity to, to different issues. Long word. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> sensitivity. Oh, that's five. Oh, that's quite bad. <laughs> uh, but it, it, you know, it keeps you on the toe because you know then you because the guy next door who is looking at your story will tell you, hey, you know. So we we, we try to be very careful when we when we do that, and uh, as but we see the 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 divide more clear and in, in the on the political desk because then you see a lot of because the language barrier is is, is a problem. You need to speak Malay uh, if you want to interview some political figures and all that. And, and sometimes I'm being called to, to cover political stories because I have, they have no choice. I'm the only Chinese-speaking guy in the <laughs> on the desk, so they have to send me to cover Chinese stories. So th those things, but the thing is, when, when you're the only guy who knows that language or, or that subject matter, you become that expert mm -hmm. on, the, on, on, on the desk, and then, and then your opinion becomes very important because it, mm -hmm. it directs the, the tone of the story. Right, and that's when we have to be really careful, and and I, I find that that kind of diversity makes us a better journalist. I think I, I feel that way. That, that's that, that's my experience, and I spent seven years there doing crazy things, <laughs> <laughs> including stalking people. Okay, I mean wow. I think we all do that. Um, just to go to what Sean spoke about, you guys are the majority, but. I would look to who are the people sitting up here at the Asia News Bureau Chief panel? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it was two white men and one Asian woman. And I, I, you know, I'll be, there, white people are, uh, can be the most effective diversity advocates. They can write about diversity issues. They can be amazing experts on Asia. But really, that the whole narrative of Asia and journalism to the rest of the world has historically been told through colonial powers who are European and American. So when you think about diversity, who are the people running the show? Who are the people running that show from America who decide how many resources go towards the Asia bureaus, which would in turn determine how many job opportunities there are here for you in Asia? Um, if you work for a foreign journalism organization. So there is a connection between diversity in America and whether you can get a job here. And you know, part of the conversations that at least I have with a lot of the media companies, you know, whether it's News Corp or you know, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and you know, one of the questions I push for, you know, how many percentage of the journalists that you hire are local? And what is it that, that you're seeing that you know, they need additional training on, or not. What are some of the area expertise that you could bring back to the to the mother ship in in U.S. You know, elsewhere. So I think a lot of the, Sharon is exactly right because when you look at who's running the show, they're not Asian. I mean, why can't there be a you know head of Wall Street Journal Asia that is born and raised in Hong Kong and educated in Hong Kong? I mean, so until you know, we produced that type of quality of work or to be able to help them find that candidate, you know, the control will always be, you know, someone else's. And and this is Asia. I mean, there's a lot of people here. I'm surely we could find talented people. And I mean, I think a diversity issue is the two tier system in these bureaus. I mean, how local reporters hires are treated and how hires from the US or whatever the native country is. Do you want to go to Eric? Sure. Yeah. Uh, why don't you, uh, Eric, you've been waiting patiently. Why don't you uh, go ahead? Hi, I'm uh, Eric Wee, and uh, many of you know me. I, I run AsiaMediaJobs.com. But um, the other thing I do also, as you know, is I run JournalismNext.com in the States, and it's a job website for journalists of color. We try to increase the number of minority journalists working in U.S. newsrooms. Um, but the, one of the things, this is an observation that we've noticed, is that uh, the main uh, place where this is a problem right now is in online media. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, our observation is, is that uh, a lot of these online sites which are growing uh, are all white. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the issues that they're dealing with are the issues that the newspapers dealt with 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they have the same justification. Is, is, you know, we can't find the people that are qualified, uh, these the programmers, the people that have the video skills that are white. And our argument to them is, is that there's plenty of people that can fill that that are uh, candidates of color. Um, so I just thought maybe you could comment about that. This is something the Online, Online News Association is thinking critically about. So I'm on their diversity committee. And so as we think about you know, the type of candidates, you know, they, they do need to diversify, and they understand that. But again, where are the candidates? You know, even within the AHA membership, when I'm looking across all of our members, you know, qualified members who could do web development and understand journalists, journalism is very limited. It's not that many. So we need to really you know, look at what is it that our industry needs and, and who are some of the candidates. I mean, I could count with one hand of like maybe less than five people I could recommend. If someone say, hey, I'm looking for a digitally savvy journalist who could do coding and who really understand you know, social media. I mean, there could be a lot of candidates in Asia, but I don't know them because they're not AHA members or they work for local media. <laughs> so, you know, so part of you know, getting the talent is you have to make yourself visible. So I think you know, in this conference alone, we did one workshop on you know, inviting the, the newsroom leaders because we want to make sure they know you exist. Right? And then we did a follow-up session on you know, general leadership because we need, you know, we need our members and just you know, journalists within Asia to be more visible to everybody, not just within Asia. But you know, again, you know, the world is con you know, more and more connected these days, and you can't just work in silos. So if you really you know, want to make a breakout, then you need to make yourself noticeable, at least to you know, AHA, so that we know if someone come to us and say, hey, I'm looking for this and this and this, then I'm just like, well, um, well I have five people in the US, but there could be like thousands in Asia that I don't know. 
Well, I would just say great point. Thank you for bringing that up because I had no idea it was so hard to find Asian engineers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, on the Seattle Times web team, when I was on the web team, I worked with three other Asian Americans. The social media producer was Indian American, Katrina Barlow was mixed race, Japanese American, Laura Rubino was half Filipino American, so they're out there. I think they're making the same excuses they made in the 80s. Great. I, we're almost out of time, and I know you're all eagerly awaiting the raffle. But let me let um, Alan Cheng, our founder, um, ask the final question here or make the final comment. And, uh... Right, this is just a very final comment. I was just talking to Ching Ching, actually. And we, we were talking about uh, perhaps next year what we can do is uh, bring in more uh, executives, news executives from Asian media mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, uh, a good number of Asian media companies that are expanding globally. Uh, Chinese companies, CCTV, and uh, even Shanghai Media Group, and uh, there, there are companies out of Japan and elsewhere. So, I, uh, so we, in AAJ Asia, I think we should make it a goal for next year to, to do that outreach, to reach out to the Asian media executives, bring them in, mm -hmm. so they can give us their perspectives and perhaps we can act as a bridge to help the senior executives of the Wall Street Journal or News Corp or whoever to interact with, this, with their counterparts here in Asia. And so I think Sharon uh, brought up a very good point about the colonialism of the media, and the dissemination uh, of, of information over the last many, many decades is perhaps as we can help be a bridge to to mitigate that and not make it in to give Asians a voice globally as well Asian media executives yeah and you know just to point out you know two of the major hire in this year's you know media company you have someone from Britain who is now running NBC and then the New York Times you know also have someone from British and you know Wall Street Journal when when Murdoch first bought you know they bought someone from British so you know where are the Asia top leaders you know they could one day actually run a global media organization, whether it's headquartered, you know, in Asia or in U.S. or in Europe. So, you know, I think as one market shrinks and another market will expand, and I think it's really important for Asia to position itself. You know, where are the top leaders now? And you know, some of the the next executive is sitting here mm -hmm. or been to this conference. And what is it that we could do? this year and next year in AAJA to help you get to that point. So, you know, it's great that we have people who come to the conference, but it'd be better if you guys give us the feedback. Say, what is it that you really want to see next year? And what could we do to help you get there? And once you get there, then you have to kind of participate, you know, beyond just, you know, sitting in a panel. Great, well, well thank you all very much for participating in this discussion. It's been very interesting. I'm sorry to have kind of a heavy talk at the, the end of the thing, but I think the raffle will liven it up a bit. And I, I do <laughs> hope this is a, a, you know, a conversation I think that, that AJ members in Asia will continue over the, over the, in the coming months to figure out how we can play a, a, a bigger role and a deeper role and a more important role in, in this whole issue of diversity in the media going forward. So um, I'd like to thank uh, our wonderful panelists who did come all the way from the US just for this, uh, uh, this conference. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.